What's up, y'all? Jonathan Owens here, man. Another episode of The Word Spoken. Man, how y'all doing today? Man, today is going to be a good episode. I hope you are ready. And if you have been battling, I hope this releases you today. Please do me a favor. Like, like, subscribe. If this has blessed you or has been blessing you, please do me a favor and like and share it. That way other people will be blessed as well. Well, so then today, I want to put you in the mind of myself. I'm going to give you my four, man, favorite go-to scriptures when dealing with bad thoughts. A lot of people probably are maybe too shame admitted and feel like we're too, feel like we're too tough, but man, we all be struggling mental-wise. And I'm not really talking about like any type of mental illness thing. I'm, I'm, you know, that's a real thing, but it is, but I'm not talking about in the sense of how the world puts it. I'm talking about spiritual battles because that's the basis of all the, like, the, of all the mental stuff, unless it's a physical problem, the, ba- the basis of all that stuff is spiritual. You saying, how can you know this? Well, that's one of the scriptures we're gonna talk about today. But I want you just to, I want, I want you to know that if you're dealing with anything, anything in your mind, please, please take this, run with it, and hopefully Lord's willing to bless you. So, now it's key to understand and it's key to, it's key to figure out why are we, <laughs> why are we even dealing with bad thoughts to begin with? Now, this is taking it back to that scripture or that phrase that I mentioned that on the basis of all the mental illness or just these bad thoughts that we deal with, because that's what this is about. It's not about that, it's just about bad thoughts. That is a spiritual undertone or a spiritual overtone, however you might say it, over or under to this battle of bad thoughts that I know all of us are facing or have faced. So that is in the scripture that I know that you probably heard. If you're a believer, I know you have heard this passage. And I know you have heard this terminology that we're about to talk, talk about. So before I get into my four favorite scriptures, I'm gonna go quickly. Let me tell you the basis, the basis of this and why it's important to fight or why it's important to you know deal with these bad thoughts because <laughs> you're not just dealing with bad thoughts. So let's tell I'm mean, gonna let me tell you the basis and tell you why it's important. So let's go quickly. Ephesians 6, we all, uh, I believe, <laughs> a lot of us already know this, so let's go to, let's go to the word, let me, let me tell you that, man, <laughs> everything you are about to hear has all helped me personally, made me stronger by the grace of God, so Ephesians 6, now let's get into the basis of this whole argument. So Ephesians, Ephesians 6, let's start at the, we'll go 12 and 13, then we probably go down, let's get down to the 17, but we'll start at uh, 12. So let's go. It says, listen here, it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Huh but against principalities and against powers. But before before I continue the reading, I continue reading, I want you to understand the context. The verse right before that said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Whew. Now what does that mean? Why is he saying armor? Why is he saying put it on? This is a battle about the face. So, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the schemes of the devil. Now, 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And have we done all to stand? And we know it says stand. So, well, if you say put on the whole armor, like, what is, what is his armor? Well, his armor has to do with the illustration of what Paul was saying as he was in Rome. And he just basically described the Roman type of, you know, get up. The Roman suit and all that, where there's a shield, buckle, a buckle, belt, uh, helmet, sword, um, breastplate, all those things that a Roman soldier would. He used that illustration to say that. Just as they went to war, we're going to go to war. So, I want you to catch the important part, though. Well, all of it is important, but the important part for today, we're going to skip down to 17 because this is <laughs> this is the part that we want to hone in on. 17. Look at this, man. Take, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, I want you to catch this. Now, uh, if you did some study on this at all, you know there's like three different words. There's like three different meanings for word of God. I mean, for, for the word in the Bible. Um, we have we have like a Greek word for the actual written word. We have a Greek word for Christ, meaning, and, meaning Logos. And then we have a, another Greek word meaning rhema, which is the actual word spoken. <laughs> yeah, that was a nice pun right there. <laughs> but that's what it means. Rhema, which is the Greek word in this passage, is rhema. Why is that important, Jonathan? Because it says that the, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. Let's take that out and put in the Greek definition. The sword of the spirit is the spoken word of God. That's what it that's, that's what it literally means. So, why is that important? It's because there's power in what we speak. And when we speak the word of God that's already written that the power that it has it becomes and it that power becomes actual power in our life. And it not only actually defeats the enemy, when you speak the word verbally, you actually are reminding yourself of what the word says about you. So if I, uh, if I hear the word about myself after I, after I have spoken it, I become more confident because now I get to hear the word of God. We already know that the Bible tells us this. It says faith come by hearing and hearing the word of God. Why is that it's so important? Because there's power when we hear what the word of God is saying to ourselves and what it's saying about ourselves. So, and we, God knows every circumstance. If somebody is mute, they can't speak anymore. <laughs> this can just as easily work when a person is speaking that word in their mind. And that's that's a lot of times we do anyway with people who still have the ability to speak when we at work or anything we're not saying it out loud but we're saying it in our mind and we're speaking and we can hear the words to ourselves in our mind so it's the same thing with a person who can't speak so this is for everybody so and or a person who's deaf they can still speak that word in their mind and they're still speaking it even though there is power in actual speaking audible words but it still has the same power for a person who is deaf or mute. So, I want to cover every basis. So, what is that? What, what, what are we getting at? This is our basis. So, that's what that means. It means speaking the word. That is your sword. That is your weapon. How do we know this is true? <laughs> Man, look at Jesus. He literally did this. When the devil came at him, what did he do? He spoke the word to the enemy. He literally said it is written and that was the end of it <laughs> it was written and what 
what did uh, Satan do? He had no choice but to do what the word of God says. He's in James, it's in the book of James, it says, submit to God, resist the enemy, and he will flee. That's exactly what he did to Christ. After Christ submitted to the Father, he spoke the word, he resisted the devil, and the devil fleed from him. It, Satan has no choice but to flee because God has already spoken it. And so, okay, now, now that we got past that, you got the basis, you know what we're talking about. Let's go and look at now my favorite four powerhouse scriptures that, man, that I use to, for me personally to battle and hopefully it blesses you. So first, let me go into Isaiah 26 and 3. Man, <laughs> Whew. I be, please be ready for this one. I mean, they're all good, but this one right here is like short and powerful, but still it's like, oh man, like how can I unpack that? So Isaiah 26 and 3. So it says, he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him that's like what do you mean like like lord how's that like what is the, how is that going to help me well the israelites have been through a lot man a lot if you read through isaiah just all a lot of the old testament they've been through a lot they were battling been through battles been through all this exile different things that that was going on through their existence in the whole old testament Man, so I, the prophet I, um, Isaiah is saying that, man, through all that, all the stuff that we've been through, the Lord is telling me, it's like, he'll keep us in perfect peace if our mind has stayed on him. So, whoo, whoo, fast forward it, go into our situation today, all the crap that you've been through, all the stuff that you've been through, all the craziness that you've been through, if you keep your mind on on him he'll keep you in perfect peace man Jonathan how does that look I don't even know how that looks well Philippians 4 and 8 tells us a little bit about that that says whatever is lovely or just or pure you know righteous if there be any virtue or any praise in it think on these things so you see how the scripture interprets the scripture that's how you can keep your mind in perfect peace. So whatever is good, whatever is good about God, whatever he has done for you, whatever whatever thing that is worthy of praising him for, whether it's waking you up this morning, whether it's thanking him for a good job, whether it's you know, blessing his name, whether it's like, man, I'm so, I'm so glad. <laughs> man, I'm so glad I got my, my car. I love my car, whatever. I mean, like my car, whatever thing you may use, and you say, "Thank God, I got this this car to drive," and and you know, go because you just saw a homeless person, or you saw this person who was taking a bus, and you was like, "Man, thank God, I got my car, man." I don't know what, man. If I couldn't go at way on the bus, it could be anything. If there be any praise in it, think on these things. Why Isaiah twenty six says he'll keep you in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him and so man how many times I use this verse probably constantly every day so what's the next one <laughs> second Corinthians 10 3 and 3 through 6 now this is a twofold a twofold passage so not only is talking about the mind it's also talking about people people who come against you and bring up things that are against God and now those things are coming into your mind thoughts because of what you've seen maybe on television what you've seen um, or heard from an atheist or heard from somebody and now the devil is trying to use that to put in arg arguments in your mind against God this passage is for all of that so let's look at that second let's go Hopefully I'm doing good. I'll try to keep going quicker and quicker. But second, second Corinthians, and then that's just 
the tenth tenth chapter. So, and hear this, like hear this, really hear this. So it says, "For we, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh." What does that mean? That means though we are in this physical body, we don't fight according to the powers of this body. I don't fight with my might, with with my intellect, with my ability to outwit somebody or outskill them. I don't fight according to the all of this. So it says, for the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, meaning they're not worldly or fleshly. But they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. What is a stronghold? It's a continuing pattern that you cannot break a sinful pattern and then you can have strongholds in the mind in the habit of a pattern of thought a pattern of um worrying a pattern of stress any of these things it becomes a stronghold because now it dictates and runs your life where you can't you can't even go to bed because you're worrying about what tomorrow is going to bring at work or you can't even you know have peace in your mind while eating dinner because you just was so stressed out that somebody did something to you and then now like the rest of your work experience is going to be whatever case may be you're now dealing with a, a stronghold potentially when you start letting it dictate your life and whether that be somebody did something or anything you have to break the pattern but how is that possible to do that Paul tells you it says how do we do this? Casting down the arguments, pulling down the strongholds, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Man, so how is that practical? How can we do that? You know, surely it's like, do I got to quote this whole verse? <laughs> no, you can find ways to do this. And you can find ways to do it quickly that's powerful to you. So anything coming, somebody trying to, you see something that says something against God, or you had a, you had that thought that was against God because of what what had happened or what what somebody said, you say, hey man, that, man, what? But I take that thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That thought is not like God, so I bring it captive to the obedience of Christ. It could be as simple as that. Not even quoting the whole thing. But you already know what that thought is. So you'd be like, man, nah, nah. I take that thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, it is a battle. It is a war. So if Satan is coming at you super hard, there is a reason. He has you on his radar. He knows about you. If you are having spiritual warfare in your mind and balance, Satan is after you for a reason. He knows God is using you for something. He knows God is trying to do something in your life. He's trying to stop it and discourage you and have you all over the place so you can't focus on the task at hand. God has put a task in hand for you, maybe at your job, maybe at your, your church, maybe for you know witnessing. He's put a task in you and Satan don't want you. He wants you to be bombarded with negative bad thoughts so you cannot focus on what the task at hand is or discourage you to think that you're not worthy enough to fulfill no if god chose you you are worthy enough because his grace and his death and resurrection made you worthy enough to fulfill the task that he gave you the strength to do so don't let those bad thoughts destroy you and who you are so that is my second favorite what's my third <laughs> so my third is in Corinthians still let's stick with the Corinthians and we'll go there so now let's now go to over to first first Corinthians so first Corinthians let's look at first Corinthians chapter 10 and you will see this next scripture that I'm um, um, hopefully you, you like this one and all of them, but because they, they, they help me. Hopefully they help you. So first Corinthians ten. Now this one is this one is this one is interesting. 
it says that huh let me see what verse I'm gonna start at. I would say let's start at twelve. So therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So what is it saying? <clears throat> there's a there's examples in the old testament when Israel Israel came out of Egypt. They still had a a bad heart, or they had a bad heart, they had a spirit of, you know, now nothing is nothing is good enough. God can't do enough. Is they even said why the one why why didn't we just stay back in Israel? I mean, um, stay back in Egypt because I mean we doing better than this out here in the wilderness. So they was complaining, complaining, and complaining, and their temptation. I mean, or their their temptation to complain. Paul said those those are examples for us. We need to learn from that. So what is he saying? He's like. Don't don't get high and mighty. Like I'm talking, talking to us Christians. Don't think that <laughs> that you can just withstand like any temptation or you, you like like you you'll fall thinking that you are so much better and stronger than them that you can't fall like they did. He said, No temptation has overtaken you except one that is coming to men. Everything that we have seen today in our temptation Somebody has faced it around the world somewhere. It says, But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will also make the way of escape they may be able to bear it. I know you probably already heard of this. What does that mean? To sum this up, or to sum this passage up, that means Satan can push you all the way to the edge. But he can never push you off or he can never make you he can never make you jump what are you trying to say i'm saying that god will stop him from tempting you beyond what you are able he can only do so much push you so far and god will not allow him to push you right up to the edge that way you you're, you're forced to jump off god was like no i'm going to show you <laughs> i'm going to show you a, a little ledge that you can jump down that you can go around the corner and that you can escape down the valley drive off in your car somewhere I'm giving an analogy but he's saying that I'm going to provide a way of escape that that temptation won't be so much that it's going to make you sin I would never do any I would never allow you to like force to be sin I, I, I love you I will God he said, God has said, I'm faithful. I'm not going to allow the enemy to put that much on you. And so we can be comforted that if something is too hard, it, it is, man, that the thoughts of negativity and doubt, self, self worth, worthlessness is too much. God's like, I'm, I'm never going to allow you to be tempted about which that's, that's, that's too much for you. I, and I've seen this. I've lived it. Where I was being tempted too so much that God literally took the temptation away from me, and I was I looked up and I'm like, where did it go? I was just flooded and bombarded with negativity, and then where did it go? Like I'm not thinking about it anymore, it's because God was like, I won't I won't I won't allow that hand to be on you more than you're able to handle it. So that's that is that's why it's one of my favorites. So. My last favorite is Romans 6, 6 through 7, and we'll read a little bit more around that. So, I guess this video is, is try to be quicker, but it's like so important with all this information that I want to just want to bless you. So, keep hanging on, holding on with me to hear this last passage, hear this last scripture, okay? Um, I'm, 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 I'm coming. <laughs> so, Romans six, six through seven. Let's, let's, let's do this. And so, let's tie this up with a beautiful bow. So, Romans, Romans six. Now, this, this passage right here is good. Like, this is really good. So. Let's start and just read a little bit right here, six to seven. 
it says that knowing this that our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves of sin for he who has died has been free from sin hmm now if we if we die with Christ we believe that we also should live with him this is important because it's saying that anything in his flesh all the sinful desires everything all the sin we, it's been crucified with Christ so no and nothing in this flesh that wants to do wrong has any power over you anymore. It doesn't have, it, does, it just does, it doesn't. So it can no longer make you sin because you've been redeemed from that. So let's go over to 11 through 14. It says, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you shall obey in it its lust. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, hmm. for you are not under the law, but under grace. This is super important. Why? I use this. How can this, how is this practical to use? How is this practical to you? Let me show you. You're going through bad thoughts negativity and you're forced you're, tr you're tempted to do something that's that's not of God you're, you're you're being tempted to think something that's not of God how can you combat this practically with this verse well you can say that man sin don't have power over me no more like I'm not going to fulfill its desires but Christ's desires I'm Sin doesn't have power with me no more. Like it, sin, when I reign, it will not. It will not reign in my mortal body. So it's different ways you can say this quickly to remind yourself of this passage. Man, sin ain't got power with me. I know what Christ did. I ain't. I ain't. I ain't finna do that, man. I ain't finna do that. I'm more than a conqueror. I like. I, I, ain't, I ain't finna. I ain't finna mess. I ain't finna mess with that. Sin, it don't got power no more. You can't make me do what you want to do, sin. That's how you gotta come. You gotta come, power, powerful like that, and come in authority. But how how is this? Because when you're doing all of this, you have to understand that if sin don't got power over me no more, like I've been crucified with Christ, you can always, in succession, say that next verse that has all the power in the world. That man, shh. greater is he that's in me than he in this world. Sin don't got, it don't have any power no more. It don't have any power no more. I know greater is he that's in me. So all these things flow and go together. These are my favorite four man scriptures that I use, and many more, but. These are like four of my favorite that I go to, and hopefully they will help you. Hopefully they will bless you, and man, leave a comment and let me know if you wish to tell me how these have helped you. That would be great. That way I could just praise God with you. So I will see you next time, man. It's Jonathan Owens. This is the word spoken. I will see you, Lord's willing.